I want to say thank you. I also want to say gracias a los organizadores por permitirme practicar mi español. <laughs> um, so, even though my Spanish is very bad, my Icelandic is even worse, and we get to practice some Icelandic today as well. Um, so I'll be discussing not only the detection of fatty acids in a couple of different Icelandic hot springs with different preservation levels, uh, but how we may be able to detect those fatty acids on Mars. Um, I'm at Towson University near Baltimore in the USA. I am the astrobiology program at Towson, but luckily I get to also spend some of my time at the NASA Goddard Center where I get to work with an exceptional team of astrobiologists. Um, so. While working at Goddard, I work on the SAM instrument, which is on the Mars Curiosity rover mission. Um, and the SAM instrument has the capability to detect organic molecules, including those made by life and those that are abiotically produced. So the study I'm sharing with you today focuses on the detection of fatty acids in Mars analogous center samples and how we may be able to identify environments on Mars to look for fatty acids. So this, uh, this study works with a couple of different siliceous center sites in Iceland. And the reason we're interested in studying siliceous center, as you've seen from the past couple of talks, is that there are several environments on Mars that are made of siliceous center, including Nili Patera, um, the talk you just saw before mine, talking about these uh, digitate stromatolites um, in uh, Columbia Hills and also some um, recent discoveries in Gale Crater by the Curiosity rover looking at um, potentially hydrothermally sourced um, silica there as well. So let me tell you a little bit about how the SAM instrument works and then how we could uh, look for similar environments on Mars to use a similar type of approach to identify organic molecules. So the SAM instrument on board the Curiosity rover is, detect is uh, capable of detecting organic molecules using a couple of different processes, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is called thermochemolysis. So thermochemolysis is just heating a sample with uh, a reagent, in this case it is TMAH, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. So this is uh, a picture of the SAM instrument before it was put into the rover. And inside the SAM carousel are 74 sample cups to accept samples for GCMS analyses, evolved gas analyses, and some of these uh, thermochemolysis and derivatization experiments. So out of all of these cups, only seven of them contain this uh, reagent, MTBSTFA, and only two of them contain the reagent we're going to talk about today, TMAH. So when we're ready to perform this experiment on Mars, we will puncture one of these sample cups that contains the reagent will deliver the solid sample, raise the cup into the SAM oven, and begin the experiment to look for organic molecules. So, why TMAH? Why use this particular reagent? So TMAH is powerful in that it can release polar molecules that are bound within macromolecules. So what this means is that the little fatty acids that are bound in this cartoon of a cellular membrane can be released and made volatile and detectable to GCMS analyses. The way that this works is that with TMAH, we react with the labile hydrogens right here on a fatty acid, which hydrolyzes the molecule and then methylates it, making it detectable to GCMS analyses. So at elevated temperatures, we are going to produce from these fatty acids fatty acid methyl esters. And then we also produce a few byproducts, trimethylamine and water. This is the instrument setup I've been using to do these benchtop laboratory experiments using an Agilent GCMS coupled to a Frontier Pyrolyzer, which is the little box on top of the GCMS here. We've done two suites of analyses. One is um, optimizing the experiment to best detect fatty acids in these samples. And then one is trying to make these experiments more uh, SAM instrument-like. And so in this case, what we're doing is pyrolyzing the sample from about 15 degrees C to 40 degrees C at a very specific 35 degrees C per minute ramp. That's the maximum the SAM instrument can achieve. And so we want to know if that is going to affect the types of fatty acids we're able to detect. So this is part of a much larger project looking at characterizing fatty acid detection in a variety of Mars analogous samples. We're just going to focus on the, the silica one right here. If you want to see the rest of it, uh, come visit AGU. So here are the three sites that we've worked in, and here's where my Icelandic is going to be 
butchered. Um, so we worked in an, an active hot spring, Havel of Lear, which is, looks like this, um, and it is in the kind of uh, mid-continent. We worked in an active hot spring on um, the southwestern coast called Gunavir, and then we worked at a relic hot spring, also on the west coast, um, called Lysul. And so in these environments, we want to see how fatty acids are preserved and detectable in these different aged environments. So to give you a, a very schematic diagram of how hot springs may look, we have um, kind of the vent area, the throat where the water comes out, and a variety of specific morphologies that form in the center as the water erupts out of the vent and flows down gradient through a, a proximal slope into some channels, into a mid-apron pool system, and then finally into a distal, distal apron. And I've got a couple of uh, excellent examples of these systems. I've seen Yellowstone. I've been to um, Gaysier. I would love to go to Altatio if anyone wants to collaborate. Come find me. <laughs> so, um, so what I want to do is use this uh, schematic system to describe these three different sites where we worked. And so what you're looking at here are FAME profiles, fatty acid methyl ester profiles, of three different areas in our active hot spring. The vent is the top diagram, the mid apron is the, is the lower one, and the one on the right is the distal apron. And so um, what we've got here in the black bars are surface samples, and then in the gray bars are going to be subsurface samples. So let's zoom in a little bit so you can see these data better. So what we want to look at are both changes down gradient in the system and then changes with depth into the system. So as we move down gradient, so moving from the vent to the mid apron and then to the distal apron, we find the proportion of fames that are longer than 18 carbons long, longer than C18. Those tend to represent terrigenous plant or algal origins. And we see the abundance increasing um, as we move down gradient, which is, cons which is consistent with lower temperature fluids um, and more growth of plant material as you move kind of away from the vent system. Um, we identified some lipids that are often associated with cyanobacteria, the C17, C171, and C181, as well as C182. Um, and these are detected in all of the systems, but they do actually start to drop off as you move further down gradients. Um, the C171 and C182 fames were not present down gradient, which is um, consistent with an expected degradation of MUFAs and PUFAs. So these are monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So this indicates that maybe we don't have a cyanobacterial community actually as we move down gradient, which, which is a little bit surprising. Um, but if we have degradation, that's possibly the cause of that. So now let's think about what's happening in the subsurface. So um, this, these data, these gray bars, which I see now may be a little difficult for you to see back there, those are representing what's in the subsurface. And um, this is still very much a work in progress, so unfortunately we didn't get the subsurface data for these last two spring, uh, spring sites yet. Come see me at AGU, I'll show you then. Um, so changes with depth. We see a loss of monounsaturated and um, polyunsaturated fatty acids at just four centimeters depth. Um, in the system, and that represents rapid degradation via either bacterial heterotrophy or diagenesis. Um, and we also see those uh, cyanobacterial fames, C17, 17, 1, 18, 1, and 18, 2, that are present in the surface sample um, are being excluded in the subsurface. So we're possibly seeing just the exclusion of a photosynthetic metabolism at depth, which is something we would expect to see. So let's move from that active system now to the inactive system. And so in this case, I have surface and subsurface samples from four locations at the vent, the proximal slope, the mid apron, and the distal apron. And so again, let's zoom in on these so you can see the fame profiles better. And let's talk about some of the changes down slope. So again, we're seeing that terrigenous plant signal um, carbon chains that are longer than about 18, and we actually see them present down gradient from the mid apron zone and then down. It's not present, or at least not preserved, above the proximal slope. So this is, again, consistent with having more superficial plant matter as you move down gradient into cooler temperatures. 
Um, and again, seeing those C17, C181, and C182 FAMES present in nearly all of the surface samples, so all of the black bars here, indicating that we have photosynthetic organisms, as we would expect, that have either colonized or recolonized the system after it became inactive. And so when we say inactive, we just mean there's not surficial thermal spring flow on the surface. Um, and so if you don't exceed about 73 degrees C, um, you're not going to necessarily exclude cyanobacteria from that surface environment. And then lastly, we're starting to see fewer lower molecular weight fames as we move down gradient towards the distal apron, suggesting again we see uh, fatty acid methyl ester degradation as we move from the vent down gradient. So looking at these samples at depth, and again depth is about seven centimeters, um, we again are seeing the loss of mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids at just a few centimeters depth, again indicating that rapid degradation. And we're seeing a lower abundance of FAMES in general in the, in the subsurface versus the surface, again uh, an expectation of rapid degradation. The elevated subsurface FAME abundance uh, relative to the surface in some of these examples, like the C12 in the vent and the C18 in the proximal slope, may indicate human or at least uh, surface microbial communities that are um, influencing the system that are not necessarily native to the hot spring environments. And then lastly, we only have four FAMES uh, detected in the subsurface in that distal apron system, again showing us rapid degradation both in the subsurface and as we move down gradient from the vent. So the very last system, that relic system, um, I'm only showing you one diagram because unfortunately I don't yet have all of the data for this relic system in this optimized form. We do, however, have it when we try to run it as we would with the SAM instrument. And so this is just from the vent system, um, and we see that in this relic system we have a variety of short to long chain FAMES, they're even and odd chain FAMES, we have mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. All this is very similar to the pr FAME profile that we saw for the active and inactive spring sites. So this, these data are very interesting because we can actually compare at the same Y scale all three of the vent sites for the active, inactive, and relic systems. And so what we end up seeing is that the inactive spring in the middle here had the lowest abundance of FAMES relative to the active and the relic spring systems. At the active vent, the C16 and C18 FAMES you see right here are, are highly elevated relative to the other FAMES. We think this is maybe due to human influences, anthropogenic input. So in these sites, these are tourist sites. Um, there are boardwalks where people walk through. And so we think that a lot of those FAMES come from outside influences. Um, whereas the lower abundances of FAMES that you see along the rest of the axis here, those are probably uh, more reflective of the natural uh, native fatty acid methyl ester profile in this system. And that's also consistent with the low abundance uh, that we see in the inactive spring system as well. So that leaves us with the strange signal we're getting from the relic system. Um, so these very high abundances, especially relative to these other systems, likely reflects um, a colonization or recolonization um, by a microbial community that's quite distinct from that found in the original active and inactive spring sites. So. Um, to think about how this may be different, what we want to do is look at what we might be able to detect with the SAM instrument if we were to look at relic spring systems on Mars. So you are used to looking at um, these graphs up top, and what I'm going to do is turn them into tables where the X's show you that fame is present, dashes show you that they were not, and you can see where we have not been able to collect data yet on some of these sites. And so let's compare this optimized version to what the SAM instrument was, would see using that SAM-like 35 degrees C per minute ramp in the pyrolyzer. So what you're seeing here, you see far fewer X's in the top than you do in the bottom. Let's step through those really quick. So we're seeing, again, short to long chain and even an odd fame, so a good distribution, mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, there are many fewer in the SAM-like system than we see in that optimized method. Um, there are more FAMES that are detected in the surface samples, and if you'll notice, I've got the vent and the surface samples will be at the top, and the subsurface will be the bottom, and then we do the same thing for the mid-apron and the distal apron. So more FAMES detected in the surface than the subsurface, as we expect from degradation of organics. And sometimes we still have preservation of mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids in the subsurface. 
So now let's compare to the inactive spring site. A very similar trend, a lot of detection with the optimized version, far less with the SAM-like version, but they are still there. So with this system, the same type of profile, short to long chain, even and odd, mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Again, more fames in the surface and subsurface as we expect. But here, we are losing all the signal from the mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we're seeing that degradation in the subsurface, and that's only at about seven centimeters depth. The Curiosity rover can drill to six centimeters depth. So we're starting, even though we see the um, fully saturated fames, we're losing those unsaturations. Um, and something else that we would expect to see with degradation is the lack of odd chain number fames in the subsurface, and so we're seeing that as well in the system. Lastly, let's turn to our relic system. Um, so like I told you, I only had that one sample. Uh, we missed a collection from a couple of sites here labeled as NC, but we do have the data run in a SAM-like manner. And so in this system, we're seeing again that same trend of long to short chain, even in odd mono and polyunsaturations. Um, but when we, are, uh, when we look at these compared to the surface and um, subsurface samples from the other systems, they have comparable number of fames in both systems, suggesting again that microbial recolonization that's overprinting the original fame profile. And we're also seeing just a little bit of uh, preservation of those mono and polyunsaturations in the subsurface. So let's summarize. Um, we find that fatty acids are present and detectable in active, inactive, and relic siliceous center using this TMAH online thermochemolysis method, um, both looking at it in an optimized way um, and also using a SAM-like 35 degrees C per minute pyrolysis ramp. FAMES uh, are presumably better preserved and therefore better detected with these analyses near the spring vent, then down gradient towards the distal apron. And so the big question is, how do we translate this to Mars? So we found hot spring deposits um, detected both from orbit and from in situ exploration with rover missions. So how can we start to look for fatty acids on Mars? So since I work with the Curiosity rover, I have to tell you some of the things that we found with the Curiosity rover. Um, amorphous and crystalline silica has been an important component of the rock mineralogy that Curiosity has explored in Gale Crater. And so this blue color is crystalline silica that we're showing present in several sites that we've explored going up Mount Sharp. Um, Albert Yen at all, they are presenting an abstract about these siliceous veins at AGU, um, describing that they may actually be formed by hydrothermal activity. And so that's very exciting. Um, the problem for us in doing this type of experiment in Gale Crater is that these are present at veins of silica without distinct spring de deposit morphologies. What we really need is to look at a system that tells us maybe where we are in the hydrothermal system, something like Columbia Hills. And so this is the work from Steve Ruff and Jack Farmer talking about the similarity of those uh, digitate stromatolites at home plate versus at El Tatio. Um, so the silica deposits in Columbia Hills have distinct digitate and nodular morphologies, as you've heard. And these are characteristic of those near vent or proximal slope environments. And on Earth, we've seen that this morphology is formed by the interaction of both abiotic and biologic processes. So, um, as we have near event environments that tend to preserve these molecular biosignatures and these digitate morphologies um, that form near spring vents, I would argue that home plates and other center deposits like it are excellent locations to test for molecular biosignatures on Mars. So we need to send more GCMSs to Mars, and we need to continue exploration of these very promising siliceous center sites. Thank you.